Uniform finite line charge. On the left, we see a line charge, a finite line charge. It has uniform charge density rho sub L. And this line charge goes from a point Z sub A up to a point Z sub B. The first question is, what is the total charge of that line charge? And let's follow the recipe that we've laid out in the theory lectures. So step one, draw the problem. Well, we've already done that, so let's move on. Choose a coordinate system. Well, this looks rather Cartesian-ish to me, so let's choose Cartesian coordinates. We'll write the general equation. So we presented a table, depending whether it's a line, surface, or volume, and whether we're calculating total charge or total field, we pulled an equation from that table, and that's what we're looking at here. So this is the general equation for the total charge of a line charge. And this is independent of the coordinate system. So we will now have to write this in Cartesian coordinates. So we do this by ex writing expressions for each of the terms. So we have a rho sub L and a DL. Well, the rho sub L is just a constant, so that just stays rho sub L. The differential length, we're integrating in the Z direction. So the differential length is simply DZ. At this point, we can choose our limits of integration. And we already know we're integrating from Z sub A up to Z sub B. And we're ready to solve this now. So the rho L is a constant coming to the outside of the integral. We just have a one in the integral and the antiderivative of one with respect to Z is Z. So now we have this uh, definite evaluation from Z A to Z B. So it's ZB minus ZA. And if we think about what ZB minus ZA, what that is, that's the total length of the line charge. So in fact, we can write a rather general equation for when we have a uniform charge density, that the total charge is the charge density times the length of the line. And this is independent of however this line might meander. If we just know the overall length, and if it has a uniform charge density, we can use that equation to calculate it. If the charge density is not uniform, then we must do the integration. The next thing we'll look at is the total electric flux outside of this line charge. And we'll follow the exact same recipe that we laid out in the theory lectures. Step one, draw the problem. And we've done that over to the left. We have our similar line charge but we've added where we want to calculate the electric flux. And we just chose somewhere over here to the right to stay completely general. Choose a coordinate system, Cartesian coordinates. Write the general equation. So we refer back to the table that appeared in the recipe. And it was a little table where depending whether we had a line, a surface or volume charge, or depending whether it was total charge or total electric flux that we wanted to calculate, we would pull an equation from that that's independent of the coordinate system. So that's how we've written this. This is a line integral for total electric flux independent of the coordinate system. But now we'll write expressions for each of these terms and take into account this is in Cartesian coordinates. So we go term by term. So we have our charge density. Well, that's just a constant. So rho sub L stays rho sub L. The differential length, dL. Well, we're integrating in the z direction, so that will be dz prime. Notice I put a prime here. And that's because our observation point will have some distance z above the xy plane. And I need to differentiate between this z and the z of where we are along the line integral. So our position along the line charge will be z prime and our position where we're calculating electric flux or where we're observing electric flux will be Z. So that's the difference between Z and Z prime. And then we have this ratio of the unit vector A sub R over R squared. And I like to think this way in terms of the physics because here's direction and the one over R squared dependence. For working problems, I much prefer vector R over vector R magnitude cubed. So what is that vector R? Vector R is the vector that 
connects wherever it is we are along the integration, so our differential current element, all the way out to our observation point. That's the vector big R. So we go ahead, we throw those things back into our original equation. We bring some constants to the outside. That's rho sub L and four pi. We choose our limits of integration. Well, that's pretty easy. We're integrating from ZA up to ZB. And so we integrate from ZA up to ZB. So we really just have this R vector divided by R vector magnitude cubed DZ prime as the arguments in that integral. So this is the integral from the previous slide. Let's go ahead and solve this. To do that, I think it's easier to integrate over an angle phi than it is over z, although both are possible. So to do this, we need to put the entire integral in terms of this angle phi. So first, what is the angle phi? Let's define the angle phi to be the angle down from this projection of our observation point over to the z-axis. So that is our angle phi. So in order to convert this integral over, we're, need, we're going to need to know what ZA is. That will be some phi one. Our ZB will just become some phi two. We'll need to write our DZ prime in terms of D phi. And we're going to need to write this ratio of R vector over R vector magnitude cubed in terms of the phi. And then we throw all of that back into the integral and convert everything from Z over to phi. So from the figure, I've shaded this triangle here and notice the angle phi. So the tangent of this angle is opposite over adjacent, right? So the tangent of this angle is opposite. So that's Z minus Z prime. That's this distance here over adjacent. And so the distance from the Z axis out to our observation point is just cylindrical coordinate rho. So tan phi is Z minus Z prime over rho. Now from this equation, I'm going to derive two other equations. The first thing I'll do is I'll solve for Z minus Z prime, and that's just equal to rho tan phi. We're going to need this on the next page. Then I'll solve this equation for Z prime. So I just bring the Z over to the other side and then switch the sign, and I end up with Z prime equals Z minus rho tan phi. Now in order to get dz prime related to d phi, I can differentiate this second equation. So when I do that, I get dz prime is minus rho secant squared phi d phi. The derivative of just z vanishes, so I really am just taking the derivative of minus rho tan phi, and the derivative of tan phi is secant squared phi. Okay, so what is the expression for r? Well, in terms of the horizontal direction, that's rho. In terms of the z direction, it's z minus z prime. Now remember on the previous page, I said we're going to need this z minus z prime and it was equal to rho tan phi. So we can just write this as rho tan phi. The next thing I'll do is I'm gonna factor out the rho from both of these terms. Notice I've also pulled out a cosine phi. Remember tan phi is sine over cosine, so this has a one over cosine, but this term didn't. So in order to pull out that cosine, I have to put a cosine in. Now, why on earth did I, did I do that? Well, notice that the magnitude of this vector here is just one. So the magnitude of R is simply just going to be rho over cosine phi. So that's, that's hugely useful. So then the magnitude of R vector cubed, well, we know the magnitude now, it's rho secant phi, we just simply cube that. Notice we have all these rho secant phi's appearing. We're gonna throw all that into our original integral and a lot of them are gonna cancel. And so uh, it will end up being much simpler in the end. So let's plug everything back into the original integral. And we end up with, here's our R vector. So that was the rho secant phi with this expression that has the unit magnitude. Our R cubed is rho secant phi cubed, and our DZ prime was minus rho secant squared phi D phi. 
So here's the integral from the last slide, and we see a lot of these row secant phi's. Well, let's think about the rows. We have a one row in the numerator, a second row in the numerator, so we have a row squared in the numerator, and then a row cubed in the denominator. So we're going to be left with just one over row, which we can also bring to the outside. We have a secant phi in the numerator, a secant squared phi in the numerator, so we have secant cubed phi in the numerator, and we have a secant cubed phi in the denominator. Well, all those secant phi's cancel, and most of the rows cancel, we just end up with a one over row that we bring to the outside. And so we're left just having to integrate the cosine phi in the a row direction plus sine phi in the a z direction from phi one to phi two. Easy to perform, the antiderivative of cosine is sine, the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, and of course, we'll evaluate this expression at phi two, evaluate it at phi one and subtract. So that's what we've done here, the expression evaluated at phi two, minus the expression evaluated at phi one. The next thing I want to do is expand this, but then collect the terms on a row and a z, which we end up with here. And then the last thing I'll do is absorb the negative sign inside these expressions. So notice I had a sine phi minus, uh, sine phi two minus sine phi one. Now I have sine phi one minus sine phi two, but there's no negative sign on the outside. So that just looks a little bit cleaner. Well, here's the final answer. And we can look at this and we can see that the magnitude of the electric flux decays as one over rho, not one over rho squared or one over, R, one over rho cubed, it's one over rho, which is I think quite interesting.